You've got silicium anodes, you've got LFP batteries. So there is a whole, let's say, the whole um, industry is now checking in, okay, what's gonna be in the next five, six, seven years or sooner, what's gonna be the direction? It's, it's, and some are focusing on solid states, some are focusing maybe on others, some are focusing on LFPs. In my opinion, we, we should be not so much focused only in one direction. We're going to end up with five derivatives. So we started off with the flagship, the EQS. We're right now here with the EQE. Mm -hmm. um, we soon will be launching the EQS SUV. I mean, we just did the interior world premiere um, in Tuscaloosa two days ago. Mm -hmm. um, and then it's going to be an EQE SUV. And then next year, a Maybach, which we actually showed a show car yeah. last year in Munich on the auto show. Now, will that this platform Will it spawn smaller vehicles or is that a separate platform that would underpin like an electric A-Class or something like that? No, this one is purely dedicated for the ENS class segment. Okay. And then by uh, 24, 25, there is going to be a platform basically on the compact side. You look at like a Taycan, you look at an Ionic 5, mm -hmm. they're based off of an 800 volt architecture. Mm -hmm. In, you know, just watering it down as, as much as possible. You are, you are the smart guy in the room, so you understand all of the benefits, mm -hmm. but for most people, it's faster charging. Mm -hmm. There's many benefits beyond that. What was the decision that led you guys to go with a 400 volt architecture as opposed to an 800 volt architecture in what is the S-Class of electric? The decision was clearly saying, okay, what are the benefits of an 800 volt? What are the benefits of a 400 volt mm -hmm. system? What are the customer demands? Um, and that's why we said, okay, if we look on the overall situation, charging time, the benefits 800 versus 400, we said as of right now, we are very, very happy with our 400 volt system. Because let's take the example maybe of charging time. It's not about the, the peak power. Mm -hmm. Um, it's about how long can you hold the power. The uh, power you put into the battery, mm -hmm. how long can you keep it? Let's say mm -hmm. if you can keep 200 kilowatts as a charging power for a longer period of time, because that's, that's t saving you time. It's not going maybe up and then go down. It's but more really consistent. It's more consistent, yeah. So, so that was the decision, basically. What was your finding? You, obviously, you did some research on the infrastructure before yes. you actually made the decision. Was there an infrastructure that could support 800 volts in either Europe or America? Or was it clearly more to a 400 volt system? I was actually uh, driving around yesterday um, around LA, which I consider obviously a very advanced mm -hmm. uh, uh, city for electromobility. Mm -hmm. And if you really looked on our MBOX screen, I saw a lot of AC chargers means uh, seven kilowatts. I saw a lot of 50 kilowatts, mm -hmm. I saw a 200, but you hardly see 350 kilowatts. Is it gonna pick up? Yes. Are we gonna stay forever on 400 volt? Mm -hmm. I don't think so. You never know what's gonna happen. So but as of right now, I think the system is more than sufficient mm -hmm. for the, uh, what the infrastructure provides us with. Who's more advanced in infrastructure, Europe or the US? Well, I think you cannot maybe combine it. Europe is very, um, you, you have a lot of uh, offers out there, mm -hmm. but it's very in-home again. So it's very um, difficult to integrate them all in your ecosystem mm -hmm. because you've got, uh, I don't know how many, you know, we think we're 450 charging points, charge point operators, what mm -hmm. we call them. US is more a little bit um, down to a couple of a handful once. So from integrating this in the in the charging network is easier yeah, mm -hmm. here than in Europe because Europe is just so wide. I mean, I can tell you I was riding from um, Atlanta to Tuscaloosa and I think there is talking about 800 volt or mm -hmm. there is exactly one 350 kilowatt charger in what is it 220 230 miles you know. You guys don't understand about this guy. He loves doing long distance drives here in the US. No. Last time he was here, he drove from San Francisco to L oh no, Las Vegas yeah. and back. And then obviously now you're doing this in the South. No. Anyway, let's look past the actual infrastructure, meaning I guess the I would call it the retail infrastructure. 
do you see either in Europe or in the US trouble with the grid as volume of EVs, not just Mercedes, but vo volume of all EVs raises. Do you see a problem with meeting the demand? I'm not a, that deep into the, uh, yeah. the system, but I would not, I cannot imagine that it's gonna be a problem. There may be peaks somewhere where we have to balance it out a little yeah. bit, but I don't think you're gonna end up I think this is an ongoing conversation you and I are gonna have over the, yeah. over the years. Yeah, I wanna keep an eye on this. Because here too. in California, we've got these problems, but I want to I want to get your world view from it because you're looking at it from a different perspective. But let me switch gears on you. Something interesting here that you talked about. Um, you're doing the motor, the design, the engineering, the manufacturing in-house on this. Um, what led to that decision as opposed to what you're doing in the EQS? It's looking at these two most valuable components, which is obviously there. Um, we think we we say okay, we want to go deeper in a vertical integration, yeah? mm -hmm. because we think this is core competency and it's gonna be uh, relevant for competition in the future. And that's mm -hmm. why we are investing with partners. I mean, with, with Yasa here mm -hmm. in place. And obviously on the battery side, we are also mm -hmm. together with partners, uh, which makes us uh, competitive. So I just wanna clarify. So do you, with this motor, you designed and engineered this, would there be a plan for you to manufacture it or you would farm that out for a partner to do it? It's, uh, I can't, uh, I mean, I can tell you all that, but what I can tell you is that we gonna re uh, we're gonna manufacture uh, things in, uh, in our plants, yeah? Mm -hmm. And there is gonna be probably also components which are gonna be mm -hmm. delivered and supplied from outside, you know? Was so not everything is gonna be done in house. Was any of this from learning over the past two years with supply chain issues? No. So no, it didn't it was, impact any of the no, development? No, here. no, no. It was clearly focusing on technology. We also announced that we have a battery plant and obviously that we are also going, uh, again, talking about vertical, one uh, mm -hmm. step deeper uh, together with a partner into cell production. But the battery plant itself has no partner, but it's our own plant. 100% I mean, yours. 100% ours. Um, we're getting our modules from uh, outside but we're also going now one step deeper and we're getting then in the future our modules directly um, from a supplier in the United States. So what what's the benefit like give me three reasons why Mercedes decided to invest in their own battery plant. Number one battery is the core of that vehicle mm -hmm. yeah, and of the future like today I mean we're building engines internally we get the modules from somebody else uh -huh. um, and we have uh, in, in that already partnerships right now and you, we are uh, further engaging now a third partner coming to the US uh, or being already in the US which is Envision mm -hmm. um, this is going to be the now a partner for the United States at mm -hmm. least uh, starting I think in the middle of the century for for uh, the platform in Alabama and then let's see what happens. And then, then if you look a little bit on the next layer, um, obviously we have a lot of partners here and in Asia when it comes to cell and cell chemistry. You know? mm -hmm. Because obviously this is also a very fast moving development and we want to be there top notch as well. So I spent a lot of time with you and the engineers in prepping for the tech review on this. And it wasn't just the more dense battery here and changing the chemical formulation, there was some discussion about a solid state battery. So what's the, what would be the benefit if I were to look, list it down? Why would you look at solid state, say over what you're doing here? Well, I mean, solid state has, has advantages. We are, we are also working on other chemistries. Um, not only solid state, but, but you have, you have, if you look at the partnerships, You've got silicium anodes, you've got LFP batteries. So there is a whole, let's say, the whole um, industry is now checking in, okay, w what's gonna be in the next five, six, seven years or sooner, what's gonna be the direction? It's, and, and some are focusing on solid states, some are focusing maybe on others, some are focusing on LFPs. I, in my opinion, we, we should be not so much focused only in one direction, but what we are trying to do is really keep it complete now and, and have our partners and really evaluate which chemistry is the one 
maybe for which model, you know, mm -hmm. I don't know. But it's too early to really say, okay, solid state is going to be so it, one. It's, it's not a, a linear space right now. There's no. no definitive answer. It's really like the wild, wild west. It's, you're still trying to figure it out, it sounds like. Well, maybe not trying to figure out, but what you don't want to do is cut off opportunities. Again, the technology is right now growing. I mean, it's speed. We are in the middle of right now where this whole industry is picking up and there are so many good ideas out there right now. Yeah. So why would you cut it off already now and not let it go and see which one is going to be the best? I don't think there is going to be the one solution. No. Kind of like internal combustion engines. There's yeah. no one solution to sunset yeah. ICEs. In fact, there could be a very long yeah. future for it. Just depends on what governments do and see if they actually uh, give us some flexibility to continue internal combustion engines. Yeah, and what, the, what at the end of the day, what the customer is going to decide, you know? See, that's where I struggle. I, I feel as if governments around the world are forcing EVs down our throat on a faster timetable than private businesses can support. And frankly, the end user who's buying the cars can support. You know, perhaps I'm going down a, a, a rat hole that's more about personal finance than it is EV technologies. But you, you know, you look at the average EV today, it's fifty thousand dollars. That, that's quite a bit of money. You know, the cars we're talking about with you guys is, at this point, hundred thousand dollars for an EQS and up, where equivalent ICE is still significantly cheaper. So I think this is something. You know what? This is something we turn around to the audience. I think we should get some feedback, feedback? from the audience because yeah. this is your first time on the show. So what I always like to do is close these episodes with soliciting feedback. So I think the big question that you and I should ask is, who's pushing the EV timeline? Is it demand, meaning customers, or is it governments around the world, or is it something in between or something that we're not, we're not seeing in this conversation? Let us know in the comments below or via our social media, Moto Man TV All in Word, Moto Man TV All in Word, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And with that, I want to leave you with one fun fact. Uh, I met Christoph like, what, eight months ago or something yeah. like that? And it has we were in Palo Alto. Yeah. Uh, Christoph is a fellow runner. And whenever he travels, he runs. And he was just in Alabama two days ago. He was so excited to run. <laughs> he made sure he wanted to have his friend go with him, and he didn't want to push his friend out of the way. So he literally fell so his friend wouldn't, and he, he, he bruised himself here. That's how dedicated this guy is. <laughs> Until we see you in the next episode, bis später. Bis später. Thank you.